one month with the Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra. SIM card in, daily use, camera comparison tests, battery drain tests, trip to MWC in Barcelona. I know this phone inside out. Small details, big importance. Let me explain. So at this point, all flagship phones, whether that be the iPhone 14 Pro Max, the Honor Magic 5 Pro, the Vivo X90 Pro, the Google Pixel 7 Pro, the Xiaomi 13 Pro, the OnePlus 11, the list goes on. They are all individually great. And all flagship phones are very similar when it comes to design and performance. So because of that, there are only fine details between them, but when you notice them and you're using the phone every day for one, two, three, four, five years, those little details can build up to have huge significance. And the S23 Ultra has tons of these tiny differences and nuances that separate it from the pack, both good and bad, like battery. Many Android flagships have a 5,000 mAh capacity or there or thereabouts, including the S22 Ultra from last year. But due to a couple of tweaks this year, the battery performance difference is vast. In daily use, as I mentioned on Twitter a few days ago, the battery drain is nothing short of incredible. You can easily go well into two days with just one charge with screen on times of eight, nine hours. And this is just something that I'm not used to when it comes to Samsung flagship phones. Yes, the 45 watt fast charging could be improved. It does feel a little bit sluggish in comparison to some of the other latest flagships around right now. I think Xiaomi have just launched a 300 watt fast charger, which charges the phone from naught to 100% in under five minutes. But give me an endurance monster over a speed merchant any day of the week. Now, part of this insane battery life is down to software optimization, more on software in a second, but a huge part of it is down to the Qualcomm Snapdragon HM2 chip inside. And this upgrade, especially for those who have been used to Exynos over the last few years, must not be underestimated. It may seem small, but the importance has been huge. The battery optimization of this chip has seen a significant upgrade, and not only that, I've noticed that combined with the faster LPDDR5X RAM and the UFS 4.0 storage, I've had the most flawless general all-round experience on a Samsung phone ever, possibly Android ever. Like, I can't remember a time that this thing has even given a whiff of a glitch, a freeze, a lag. And the Twitter scroll, which is usually a dreaded stumbling block for a lot of phones, is as smooth as your boy on the dance floor. And the gaming experience hasn't been too shabby either. I don't feel it's got as hot as previous models. It can play all of the big system demanding titles without the need for compromise. I'm just super impressed. Strangely, when I compared the supposedly overclocked four Galaxy version of the 8 Gen 2 to the standard version of the same chip in the Xiaomi 13 Pro here, it was the Xiaomi phone that actually seemed to offer slightly stronger numbers in benchmarks. Small point, no real world use difference between the two, but just interesting and possibly a marketing gimmick by Samsung, maybe. But the Qualcomm chip also helps with camera performance. And using Samsung's also undeniable hardware camera capabilities, the difference to last year and to its closest competitors may appear small, but has big importance on that end result. I mentioned in my very detailed camera comparison amongst a lot of the top 2023 flagship phones, how the small upgrade to stabilization now makes it industry leading. But on top of that, portraits are to die for, photo details for cropping and night shots with the addition of the new 200 megapixel sensor can be epic. And zoom shots with the dual telephoto lenses have in testing been completely unrivaled, not only in terms of distance, but also in terms of the accuracy and smoothness of the scroll in finding certain subjects. There really isn't any area of the S23 Ultra's camera that are necessarily weak, but that doesn't mean improvements can't be made. The ability to actually find a specific zoom length outside of the default ones can be finicky at times, as an example. Portraits with moving subjects, pets and the like, are still not quite pixel level in terms of reliability, of limiting motion blur, and at times the audio on video has sounded a bit off. I don't know whether that's human error, me holding the phone in stupid ways, possibly, but it's just something I have picked up on. And there are a few other areas of this phone that I'm not so keen on. Number one, the lowest volume level is still quite loud. Not a huge point, but if you're trying to sneakily watch something and you don't want to put your headphones on, the cat might be out of the bag. Number two, the S Pen has in my experience, got a slight disconnection problem. I don't know whether it's just on my handset, and I don't know whether, it, I presume it will be, fixed on a future software update, but every now and again, the connection drops for 
no reason, even if I've only just taken it out. You can change the settings to force it to always stay connected, but I don't think you necessarily should have to. And sometimes the tip doesn't actually register when clicking to send a message on Instagram, for example, and I've had to use my finger instead. You may be wondering why I'm using an S Pen for Instagram, and that's a very acceptable question. Mainly it's because I've got pretty lazy in bed and I quite like just holding it in one hand and just using the pen outside of that possibly strange use case. I've also found the S Pen great for using the translate feature when I was in Barcelona for MWC. The live message and text scan options have also been utilized as has the really helpful object eraser tool. Quick ring around the object and bam, it's gone. Like it never existed with almost zero distortion to the remaining image. I do have another couple of potential negatives which could be absolute deal breakers for you, but right now what else do I love about this phone? And if you're enjoying this video so far, a like and subscribe would be absolutely wonderful. Number one, the haptic feedback on the S23 Ultra is an absolute joy. The small vibrations when texting and jumping in and out of different apps is so subtle, so clean, and you can alter the strength to suit you. It's honestly God tier. And the animations feel the same. They're just so polished now on One UI 5.1, and the customization of themes, icons, fonts, etc., are just brilliant. The fingerprint scanner is also lightning fast and incredibly accurate, and the zoom to fill action on YouTube is also the best I've ever seen. Incredibly niche point, don't get me wrong, but ever since YouTube introduced the zoom to wherever you want feature on YouTube, which I don't know why on earth you'd want to do that, but each to their own, I suppose. I've always found it annoying how it doesn't properly snap into place for the just full screen. You'd often go too far and then you'd go back the other way and you'd go back too far the other way. You'd never just be able to snap it to full screen and back. Not on the S23 Ultra though. Bam, bam, bam. Bam. And if you do want to zoom in further, you can do. It just feels more deliberate. Little details, big importance. But one other small detail that could have big importance for you is the bloatware and the sheer amount of it. 55 gigabytes on here, it seems, on mine, straight off the bat, which means if you're getting a 256 gigabyte storage option, then you're losing pretty much 20% straight away. By far the most, I think, on any phone that I've tested. And I think a lot of it doesn't really need to be there either. The doubling down on apps that Google do and do so well, for example, seems a bit of a waste of time. And it feels like Samsung haven't really listened to reviewers and consumers alike in this department because I can't think, and there will be exceptions to the rule, but I can't think of anyone that I've really spoken to that necessarily wants that amount of additional software on their Samsung phones. Most people say in terms of software, they like a clean light as close to, or if not stock Android experience. And I just feel it's a bit of a shame because this phone would be even better if it was a bit lighter. Yes, you can delete or disable a lot of those apps, but it is another step. And for a lot of people, the average consumer, they won't really know that that's even an option. One thing you can't change, however, is social media integration. And this is one thing that has often let a lot of Android phones down in comparison to the iPhones. How certain social apps behave. And yes, Samsung undeniably have made huge strides in this department over the last few years, but some of the features still seem a little bit off. Simple things like sharing a tweet as an Instagram story, for example, center on the iPhone when it pops up, weirdly off center at the bottom on the S23 Ultra, an extra step to make it look clean. And similarly on TikTok, if you are using the video feature, the zoom just seems a little choppier on the S23 Ultra. And this could be hugely important if you are one of those TikTok creators who likes to zoom in and out on your own face. We've all seen the videos. Nobody wants to see inside your mouth or up your nose. Just back, just back the cap, back the camera off. All right, just back it off. <laughs> in all seriousness, there are certain elements to the S23 Ultra and social media that just aren't quite as fluid still as on the iPhones. But Snapchat, I hear, is not one of them. Not that I use it, but it has had great feedback. And I generally shoot a lot of my content in the native camera app anyway, and then post it to socials after. So none of that really bothers me. One practical difference between the S23 Ultra and the iPhone 14 Pro Max when it comes to this sort of content is that I believe the S23 Ultra has a 26 millimeter focal length on the front camera, 24, which is wider on the iPhone 14 Pro Max. So I think some people believe that the Samsung phone makes your face look a bit wider, small detail, 
could have big importance. I'm also aware that a lot of that last section was based around you creators out there and not so much you viewers. And if you are in that second camp, then you're gonna have a brilliant experience regardless because if I had to pick one phone that is the best that is currently available for watching media, gaming, I would probably pick the S23 Ultra. That display is a star elite. Those very subtle curves do give off pure immersion whilst still giving all the practicality and clean nature of a flat screen. But on top of that, the rounded edges on the back make it nice and comfortable for long term use. But importantly, the flat side rails make it super grippy compared to the previous generation. Yet to drop this beast, which for me is uh, it's an achievement. Uh, just pretend and don't do that, you will actually drop it. So as expected, it is undeniable that in an ocean of incredible smartphones that are available, the S23 Ultra is one of the greatest phones on the planet. The question is, do those tiny but incredibly important differentiating details discussed mean it's the perfect phone for you. It is my current Android phone of choice, but those small details might make you look elsewhere. And I'd love to hear what you think on that matter in the comment section below. Would you go with the S23 Ultra or would you go with one of a sea of other Android flagship phones or indeed the iPhone 14 Pro Max, for example. Either way, the S23 Ultra is undeniable in its greatness. Over to the rest of the Android space and Apple later this year. Let's see brands what you've got 2023. Drop a like on the video and subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed this content and follow me on my other social medias, Instagram and TikTok for more shorter form video and photo content and Twitter for all that banter. My name's Adam. You've been the best as always. I love you and leave you. I'll see you in the next one. It's SBRT. Peace out.